neonatal skin breaks? Are they causing more than just pain? And we have two speakers, Michelle Stubbs, who is a research nurse from the Neonatal Intensive Care Unit at John Hunter, and Joe Davis, who was at John Hunter, is now Improvement Lead for Maternity and Neonatal Safety Program at the Clinical Excellence Commission. So I'm going to stop sharing and hand over to Michelle first, I believe. Over to you, Michelle, and you should be able to connect straight in. Thanks, Karen. Um, you're actually all stuck with me first. So um, <laughs> I just also wanted to um, say thank you to Julie for the opportunity to share our story here today. And thanks to all of you who have joined us online. Um, so as Karen said, my name's Joe, and I'm a neonatal nurse by background, and I worked uh, for many years at John Hunter Children's Hospital in Newcastle, and I've recently joined the CEC in New South Wales. Um, and I'll invite Michelle to come off mute now to introduce herself, if that's okay. Hi, I'm Michelle. I'm the research nurse at John Hunter. I've been a neonatal nurse for longer than I care to admit, so we'll just leave that as the introduction. <laughs> Thanks, Michelle. And um, so we're going to be talking about our journey that we started back in 2019, um, which is the POKE study. And really what that's doing is exploring neonatal skin breaks and whether they're causing more than just pain. Before we begin, though, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands where we gather today and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. I recognise their connection to country and their role in caring for and maintaining country over thousands of years, and may their strength and wisdom be with us today. Today we are joining you from the beautiful Awabigal country. So, when you see this word, vital organs, what comes to mind? What's the first thing that pops into your head? I'm pretty sure that skin wasn't the first thing that came to mind, and that's fair enough because these are all the sexy organs. But our skin is a big deal, literally, as the, ki the kids these days would say. It is the largest organ in the body and it's one of the most complicated. It's, it has many roles in the maintenance of life and health, hence why we feel it's an unrecognised vital organ. It works as a barrier protecting against water loss as well as physical and chemical injury and other pathogens. It helps fight off pathogens via the immune system components that exist in our skin. It regulates temperature through vasodilation and constriction, evaporative cooling and fat storing. It provides UV protection through melanin production. It provides a sense of touch and stimuli through interaction with physical surroundings and supports all fine and gross motor activities. It's responsible for vitamin D production, which is important for disease pre prevention, such as cancer, health, heart disease and obesity. And it, it wound heals. It does the job for us. So pretty amazing um, and very important organ. So for now, I want you to keep thinking about the vital organs like this. For those of you who, who might not recognise this picture, I'm pretty sure you all will, this is the British Royal Family, and I'll actually let you decide which member is which vital organ. No comment from me. So let's look a little closer at the skin. So as we touched on before, skin has many, many functions. The skin's major roles for babies is really supporting thermoregulation, minimising electrolyte loss, acting as the first line defence against pathogens. So it's composed of three major layers. So we've got the epidermis, which is the outermost layer that provides initial barrier to external environment. So each job is to protect. Then we've got the dermis, which is the deeper layer that contains connective tissues, vessels, glands, follicles, sensory nerve endings, and muscular tissue. And then we've got the hypodermis, and this layer is really just the adipose fat and fibrous tissue. So I want you to think of the skin like Buckingham Palace. So this is the barrier to protect the vital organs. So now let's look at the skin development. So functional and structural skin development is a dynamic process. So ectoderm cells are present by around week four. So the fetus already has two distinct layers of skin. 
a bottom cell layer known as the basal layer, and an outer layer called the periderm. Between the eight to 11 week mark, we start to see basal layer um, being more produced and more intermediate layer cells. So it's, we start to see that transition from a single layer to around three layers. Then moving on to the 11 to 17 week mark, we start to see some epidermal ridges and grooves beginning to form. Moving on between the 17 to 22 week mark, we've now got four to five layers of epidermis and vernix begins to form. Moving into our 23 to 24 week range, we've got epidermal layer begin, beginning to proliferate and we've got our stratum corneum existing at only two to three layers thick. And let's think about that. These are the babies that we are caring for. Very, very thin skin. So around the 25 to 26 week mark, um, our epidermis is fully keratinized. Our stratum corneum is only now five to six layers thick. Moving on to the 27 to 30 week range, our vernix and stratum corneum continues to thicken throughout that stage. By the 32 to 34 week mark, we're seeing more epidermal maturation and it's now largely complete. So we've got our functional barrier established. Moving on to the 35 to 40 week mark, we've got thick vernix that covers the skin and the creases. Our stratum corneum is now well formed between 10 to 20 layers, which is equivalent to an adult. However, it's not fully functionally equal. It still remains about physically 30% thinner than adult skin. After birth, skin maturation in the preterm infant is postnatally accelerated, and that usually occurs over the first two to three weeks. However, in our more extreme preterm cohort between 22 to 25 weeks, they can actually experience more impaired barrier function for up to around the 32-week mark. Compared to mature infants and adults, the dermis in our preterm babies has less structural protein connecting to the epidermis, the collagen fibre bundles are small, and the elastic fibres are sparse and immature. So this leaves our premature babies susceptible to skin injuries, which we well know. The microbiota refers to the microorganisms that colonise the human body. It plays a fundamental role in preventing the growth of pathogens and modulating immunity pathways. During pregnancy, the maternal microbiota affects the development of the fetus. Babies' microbiota develops over time, reaching mature colonisation at around two to three years of age. This is different for our extremely preterm babies who have a lower total microbial diversity than our full-term infants. The development of the neonatal microbiota is influenced by the mode of de delivery, which affects vertical transmission, our gestational age at birth. So our prams obviously require care in hospital and have exposure to treatments such as antibiotics and parental feeding that can interfere with the natural estab establishment. The feeding mode, and as we know, breastfeeding is well recognised in regulating gut microbiota and other environmental factors, such as limited skin-to-skin -skin contact with parents and or caregivers, the use of skin prep solutions, and hands, our hands of us healthcare workers, to name a few, all of which will alter the colonisation and development of the microbiome. And here's our microbiota. So we can see we have our royals as our vital organs inside doing the busy work. We have the palace, which is our structural barrier, our skin, protecting what's on the inside. And then we have our individual royal guards working as a team to stave off any invaders and protecting both the palace and the royals. And that's our microbiota. So what does injury to the skin look like? So a wound is defined as a breach of the integument beginning at the stratum corneum and or changes that disrupt the normal structure or homeostasis. So in the neonatal unit, as we know, this occurs a lot through procedures and skin breakdown. 
and some examples of common procedures you can see here and what we've termed as our pokes. We wanted to focus on this more measurable iatrogenic skin bre breaching practice. And while we acknowledge that skin breakdown remains a confounding issue for our prem babies, um, we felt that because not all skin trauma is well captured or documented in our healthcare records this way, um, we didn't explore this. So here we can see an actual example of one of our study participants where it demonstrates the number of skin breaks per day. You can see here that this, this is actually a baby who had a high number of pokes in any one day, up to 18, two days in a row. On the next slide, we can see that another study participant and their number of pokes per day, the number's a lot lower, but we can see that we're still interrupting the skin integrity almost every day. So as Simons and team describe, although previous studies have reported the frequency of daily procedures in the NICU, which is demonstrated in this table here, the number of failed procedures had never really been evaluated at the time. So they explored procedures for access placement and attempts that were not successful. And you can see on the next slide that they found that with cannulation, there was a 31% failure rate. With a peripheral art line, there was 37.5% failure rate. And with our umbilines, there was almost a 35% failure rate. Lower failure rates were seen in venipunctures, punctures, which was sitting around the 21% mark, and lumbar punctures around 17.5%. And what this really demonstrates is how every poke counts. Every time we go to the skin, it counts. So what are we actually poking for? So this slide demonstrates our current data um, that on average, out of the pokes collected, 80% are actually investigation compared to 20% being treatment pokes. And so what that really is telling us is we need to start asking, should, should we actually be poking? And what is our procedural practice like? Could we actually get better at this? Um, because skin injury isn't without risk and harm. Because of the accelerated formation of both the granulation tissue and the extracellular matrix in neonatal in neonates, their wounds commonly um, close quite rapidly. However, th this depends on the extent and level of the skin injury, obviously the clinical condition of the baby, and most importantly, the age of a baby. These all play critical roles in wound healing physiology. And as we know, our extremely preterm babies have limited immune and metabolic capabilities. And as these babies often have higher other physical, physiological priorities, this obviously can impact on the timing of skin repair because it goes down the ladder. It's not as important. It's not, it's not as important as those sexy vital organs. So our question, and the question is, is, is this a problem? Does frequent skin injury actually create an opportunity for infection? So we can see the incidence of late onset, onset sepsis remains high in our extremely preterm infants. And as we know, has a significant impact on long-term neurodevelopmental outcomes. So our late, onset sep late onset sepsis incident rates in our extreme PREMS remains higher, particularly in the really vulnerable less than 25 week population. We know that there's an obvious relationship between central lines and sepsis and hen hygiene compliance and infection rates. And lots of work has been done in that space to try and change practice. But the question is, is there something else that we can do to reduce these rates? Uh, just a friendly warning on the next slide. There's some quite graphic images. But I'm sure that we've all seen this before we've seen that infection that has stemmed from skin breaks. And these are just a couple of examples. 
So then we needed to ask, well, where is the evidence? Um, and we actually couldn't find any current data that shows the effect of iatrogenic skin injury and the risk of late onset sepsis. In our exploration, we found that the evidence really just describes the experience of procedural pain, the skin breakdown and the increased risk of infection, the preventative skin care strategies and the tools that exist to support that, and the effects of routine blood sampling. But we found that there was really a gap in the evidence exploring the question, are skin breaks causing more harm than just pain? So the starting point, we did a, a pilot study over a two month period um, where we did a comparison of pokes across a special care room setting and an intensive care room setting. And in this short period of time, the babies in ICU actually experienced six times more skin breaching, which we know because they're the most at-risk cohort and having more intervention, but they're also the at most at-risk cohort in regards to infection. The highest pokes um, during this pilot was actually nine pokes on one baby, but that was in one shift over an eight-hour period, which shows us that was at, on average this baby was being poked one time per hour. We also identified that the baby's skin was being breached on a daily basis. So then we wanted to go and do a deeper dive, and that's when we pulled together the Pope study. So here we, our study hypothesis, you can see is that we hypothesised that a high number of skin breaks is associated with an increased risk of late-onset sepsis in extremely preterm infants. So the aim of this study is to explore the association between iatrogenic skin breaks and late onset sepsis. The way we're doing this is through a prospective observational cohort study in infants under 29 weeks gestation. So what does POKES data actually look like? So we are tallying it on a data collection sheet for all actual skin breaks, including attempts, and then the reason for the skin break is collected under two themes, which you can see here is an investigation poke or a treatment poke. Um, the poke's data is being collected for 28 days post the birth. So what are the pokes? Um, I won't read them all out because they're described there. Um, but we decided to um, exclude umbilines as we weren't really breaching the skin integrity in that way. And we also decided to exclude um, our surgical babies, despite this being a massive skin uh, breach. Um, we, re we realised that there would be probably a minimal number of 29-week um, babies having surgery, noting that it did start um, in our centre at John Hunter Children's before we went multi-centre. Um, and we also didn't want to confound the data. So how are we collecting the data? Well, we just totally went old school. Um, we felt that paper-based, whilst not ideal, was probably the best way because we could keep it by the bedside. It would be really driven by the nurses and clinicians um, so that they could just tally up each time a skin break attempt occurred. Um, we do know that there will be underreporting, um, and this will be described as a confounding factor in the findings. Um, so I might hand over to Michelle now, who's going to continue to talk to um, the data collection and, and what our current data is actually showing. Helps if you unmute. Sorry, thanks, Joe. <laughs> um, so we decided that to make sure we understood what we were collecting, we would look at late onset sepsis um, as defined by the NICUS definition. So we'd look at dates, organisms, and what the treatment course for that was. Um, also look for basic clinical outcomes. So make sure that we understood what conditions babies were in and make sure that we weren't um, skewing the data one way or the other. Our, sorry, our sample size um, as per our statistical analysis 
people is 775 infants. Um, we were very lucky to get a waiver of consent through the ethics department. And within this, um, we developed a parent information sheet that allowed parents to opt out if they wanted to. And I don't want to jinx it here, but there has been no parents as yet that would didn't want to participate in the POKE study. We've actually found the opposite. Where parents are actually quite excited to know um, why their babies are being poked, reminding staff to record the pokes, asking where the pokes folder went when we removed it after 28 days and also requesting to know how many pokes their babies received. We have a very amazing research team and we have been, um, the project does require a lot of commitment from our team um, that has been absorbed into their current roles for most of our PIs. They have been given no additional time um, for, to carry on being the POKES PIs. Um, we're lucky enough to have a cross-section of all nurses as PIs. So we have a NUM, CNCs, research nurses, as well as clinical nurses that are the site PIs. Um, I just also want to pause just here for a second and thank Kurt for all his support and guidance in getting this off the ground because um, without him, it, we probably wouldn't be sitting here today. And we really do appreciate the fact that he has let us run this as a nurse-led study with just providing guidance and not a great deal of interference. Um, currently, as you can see, we are doing an amazing job at recruiting babies. While our total recruitment is 781, we have had to withdraw a few babies, which I'll discuss in the next slide. So technical recruitment is 755. We are so close to our recruitment targets. Um, we have had 809 total eligible babies across the sites during their recruitment period. Um, of these sites, three sites have a 100% recruitment rate of eligible, of eligible babies, which I think is a massive achievement. Across all the sites, though, we're running at a eligibility of 95% with only 5% missed. And most of the time these babies were missed because um, the PI was off on unexpected leave. We have had to withdraw some babies from the sites and it's usually... Um, because the baby was transferred to a non-participating site or we've ended up with the baby being transferred to a um, to, to in between two participating sites and being assigned to study numbers. So the baby's still in, but their second duplicate number has been um, removed. Um, and we've also had a couple of babies that were thought to be under 29 weeks at birth. They were enrolled and then after birth they were... Um, evaluated to be greater than 29 weeks. Um, we're projecting that we will meet recruitment targets by August, September this year, which is a fantastic effort from all our sites. Um, before I go any further, I just do want to make this quick disclaimer that the data that we are about to present is incomplete. Um, as obviously we haven't met our recruitment target and there is more checking, data checking to be done. Um, and the POC study has a very complicated statistical analysis, which is way above my ability. Um, so the results presented today are of unknown signific statistical significance. We've completed a full data set on 500 babies. And as you can see, that's lots of little babies there. Um, other, our other recruited babies that we haven't completed data sets on is because we're still waiting for clinical outcomes, discharge information, or there's a query in the information that's been gathered that's been lodged with the recruitment site. And there may also be a small little mountain of data to be entered sitting on my desk, as you can see from that picture. 30% um, of our enrolled babies have had their pokes, tallies check for accuracy. This is a very time-consuming process that requires the PI to um, cross-check between clinical records and POKES tally forms and make sure that we have recorded every single POKE that the baby has received. Um, the issue with this is that under-reporting could still, we could still be under-reporting because we can only record a retrospective collection as one attempt. So if an I've what I mean by that is if an IV was inserted, we don't have no way of retrospectively knowing if it went in on the first attempt.
Um, I just want to put a number out there, 20,066. That is the number of pokes that we have recorded in 28 days for our babies that we have looked at their data for. Um, as you can see, day one is the highest and there is thir over 3,200 pokes recorded from all babies that we have done the data analysis, data collection on so far. But even as you go down to day 28, we're still close to 500 pokes um, for these little babies. The lowest day we did have was 275, but that's still well over half our babies got a poke on that day. Obviously, being day one, zero one is the highest number of pokes with babies getting four and a half pokes each on average. So what have we discovered so far? We have discovered that on average, if you do uh, um, look at the babies, every baby, including babies that have sepsis, 32 pokes is the average pokes that babies get in a 28-day period, reinforcing Joe's earlier message that constant we're constantly breaching these fragile skin barriers and opening the door on regular occasions or the gates if you go back to the Buckingham Palace analysis. <laughs> um, just a quick overview. The highest number of pokes out of any one baby was 139 in 28 days. Um, a baby that, this was a baby that didn't end up with a septic episode, but the highest number for a baby that did was 117. And when you um, compared babies that did have a sepsis episode and didn't have a sepsis ep episode, you can see that a no septic episode baby ended up with 30 pokes in a 28-day period, where a baby with a septic, late onset sepsis had 42 pokes per baby. Um, for this analysis, we did exclude babies with early onset sepsis. We thought this was a perfect opportunity to touch on why nurses should get involved in research. And while it's easy to focus on the barriers to nursing research, such as time, experience, funding, attitudes, and competing priorities, there are many benefits. And this includes advancing nursing care, allowing nurses to become better advocates for their patient and families, providing the best possible evidence-based care, fostering the engagement of nurses in current evidence, and bringing a different perspective to nursing. What are the POKE successes? We've had amazing recruitment rates and nursing research requires baby steps that are often small and unsteady, but they need to be celebrated. Um, we have an amazing PIs, POKE's champions and overall nursing staff who contribute to the success of the POKE study. Staff attitudes have been amazing to this nursing research study and that comes from all angles, that comes from medical as well as nursing and even parents. Our parent engagement, I think, was one of our biggest surprises of, and we um, are very much happy to celebrate that. And as far as we're aware, it's the first multi-centred nurse-led clinical focus study across all sites in New South Wales. It wasn't without its barriers. Um, so funding is always an issue with any research study. So we did get some funding for statistics as well as some funding for some data entry. Um, we rely on clinical staff to be accurate with the rec recording of pokes. We have had some changes to our PIs. Lucky people have managed to retire or have switched to different positions. And anyone who's done a research study knows the joys of Regis and ethics applications. We've learnt a lot by doing this nurse-led research study. It does require a lot of passion and commitment from everyone involved. You do need good support, um, communication and engagement from research leads, and our parental engagement is invaluable and make sure that we're pitching information at the correct level. So what's next? We're planning on finishing off our recruitment. We'll continue with data collection and entry start the complex statistical analysis and commence writing up expected outcomes and considerations, including as maybe a secondary outcome of, are we doing too many blood samples? 
just to reiterate um, this slide, that 80% of our current pokes babies are receiving investigational pokes and only 20% are treatment. Um, this was a study that looked at um, how often clinical changes are made from blood testing. It was a study that looked at 1,200 blood tests and it showed that 69% of tests resulted in no change. As for our pokes babies, um, you can see our bloodletting is our highest number of pokes with well over 1, 000, uh, sorry, 14,000 pokes. Um, and if you apply the percentages as we previously in the previous slide, that meant that over 10,000 pokes were conducted with no clinical change, which again raises the question, what are we poking for and how much risk are we putting our little babies at? Thank you. Thanks so much, Michelle and Joe. Really interesting presentation. And 139, what a number in 28 days. There are a few questions in the chat. Martin, um, did you want to ask yours or do you, would you like me to read it out? If you want to ask it, please unmute. Yeah, I have unmuted. I'm happy to uh, ask. Yeah, please do. Um, and Michelle, you just you actually showed the abstract mm -hmm. of the paper that I was, uh, my question was referring to. So I was, I was interested um, uh, well, first of all, congratulations, great study and, and amazing numbers of patients and high enrolment rates and a very interesting presentation. I mean, re really reminding us how important the skin is. Uh, I think, uh, as you say, it's something we, we really don't focus on until it all goes badly wrong. So, um, yeah, we, we collected information um, not only about the, um, the number of pokes, but also we were interested in were there certain types of pokes that didn't result in any measurable clinical action, uh, a, a change in a ventilator setting or a change in, um, you know, a, a, some a, some other electrolytes which didn't require any treatment, et cetera. Because uh, I think that's often, uh, it's an important thing for us to really understand what are we, what the reason we're doing um, a skin breach and what what's the likelihood that it will result in some outcome. And the typical, the one that we were really uh, down on was routine capillary gases once a week twice a week whenever they might get done because people were just wanting to surveil surveillance of the baby just to make sure that they weren't getting a quietly rising carbon dioxide or a slowly dropping sodium uh, but we found that you know, that category of tests the routine tests was the least yield and that there were really large number of tests being done without anything uh, changing um, and that did make us more aware. I think one of the things you mentioned there was being more aware of the number of, well, that's actually the next question, more aware of the number of pokes that are being done. Does that then result in um, uh, less pokes because, and particularly less pokes for things which aren't very fruitful? So the, I suppose the key question is, did you collect that information in the poke study about the reason the tests were done and what the outcome was? And, and could you do it in a small subset of babies if you haven't done it for the whole study, though it's a bit late now because you're almost finished? But... Is that of interest? Is that a maybe a plan that you might do something for in the future? Um, we didn't look at why the test was taken. Uh, our study wasn't to um, look at changing practice. It was purely to look at um, why, like the numbers that we were getting, um, whether we do it for a small subset I would have to discuss that with the PIs and see how keen they are to do that because that would be a lot of work going back for them to go back through records. Um, I guess that's something we can look at in the future. Uh, do you agree with that, Joe? Yeah, definitely. I think I think now that we've come to the end, it's we've got more questions <laughs> around. Well, what can we do next? Where did, where next can this take us? So um, it would have been great to have started that. At, at the beginning to to support the work that you've done um but yeah i guess we'll go back together with our team and i don't know if kurt wants to 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 jump in and say anything but that'll be what we'll be thinking about what's next what else can we go back and look at um and re-explore 
And I think Joey answered that really well. You know, this is this is how research works. You do a start and a test and a you know a project, and then you get the results. And then the results lead us to the next projects and the next questions. And the detail which is required to answer Martin's question is is quite big. <laughs> you know, um, good on you. You could have those um, twelve hundred um, tests uh, reviewed, um, but that might might as well be a a way forward. You know, what do what are we doing, and um, does it actually uh, help us in our clinical management? Um, I, I can certainly see that as as the next step after we analyze this data. Yeah, great. There's some more questions in the chat. Lucy said it would be interesting to see if being cognizant of the number of blood tests reduces the number you see from the beginning to the end of your recruitment. In, would you have that in your data? We we did think about this at the start that uh, having this conversation, we might start to see. Um, a shift in practice, even throughout, um, even some of our own neonatologists um, who are online today um, may be very familiar with that as well. Um, but I think really the focus of the study was still to explore the relationship between skin breaks and the rates of late onset sepsis. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll, we can look at that for sure. Um, but we were expecting that from the start. Um, another question, is there a way to classify the pokes as necessary or could be incorporated into other tests? Again, that's hard if you haven't collected it prospectively. Um, I think that goes back to what Martin was saying. Yeah. I think that will be something that we'll have to decide and look at at a later date um, because... We haven't collect. We didn't want to dictate care. Basically, is the focus of the study. So therefore, we didn't tell people that they had to do X amount of whatever. So it's not something we've collected, um, and it will be something if we go down that path. It will have to be Some nice a big study. Commending you both in the study. Well done. Excellent presentation. Another question: Could you tell us some more about the parental responses? What was their questions and comments? Did they ever ask us to reconsider poking? Ooh, that's interesting. I spoke to quite a few parents when it, especially when it first came out, and um, they were very keen to know why we were poking their babies. And it, I think, it put that thought into clinicians' head of, are we just doing this for a routine purpose? Um, I remember one parent in particular was very up like not upset but was like so where's my pokes folder gone and how can I keep it there for the whole stay hmm. um so that I personally the parental engagement with this actually really surprised me because I've done a few studies and quite often people will just sign the consent form but this one I seem the parents seem to want to get more involved and wanted to have a say in um making sure that we were actually collecting how many times we were breaching they, their little baby's skin. Fascinating. Another question here is, was there a correlation between the number of pokes and the increase in other interventions like transfusions? Did you have that data? That's not something we've explored. Um, yeah. No, but we could, again, for the next These are all great thoughts and great questions that we can go back and add to our questions and, yeah. and see if we can yeah, pull on that, even if it is, like Martin said before, a subset of the um, participants. Yeah. And then just a comment here saying, oh, thank you for a simple, clear presentation. Just to point out that ECG lead removal leads to skin injuries too, as seen in the scars noted in the follow-up outpatient department. Just a comment there, absolutely. Yeah, and I completely agree, Thomas. And like we did, we did go back and forth around because we know skin breakdown is a massive issue. Um, but again, it just goes back to that whole thing around it was really challenging to get clear documentation on skin breakdown and the grading and level of it as well in relation to it being a, a skin injury. Yeah. Yeah, great. Um any other questions, if you want to raise your hand and ask a question, please do. And um, Michelle or Joe, if you stop sharing, then I can just put up the attendance slide as well. Any other questions for them about the study? Um, 
I've got another one here. Do you think including umbilical lines in your study would have made some difference to the number of pokes in the initial days where the pokes are the highest? That's a great question. I mean, and we also talked about this because obviously if you've got umbilons, it means you don't need to necessarily access in other ways. Um, and so again, okay, I feel like I've broken record, but this will be something we'll we'll go yeah. back and look at. And Janelle's comment, was there an increase in the infection rate? What was that about, Janelle, Nora? With the number of um, pokes that were done, is that was that the question? I think it might be, and it's too soon to tell. So that's, tell. <laughs> yeah, that's the next stage. So as soon as we complete the data collection, that's the answer we're looking for. Excellent. Sorry, I was just couldn't find my mute to unmute. <laughs> no, it's a great question, Janelle. We're all eager to find out the answer. Mm, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Very interesting study. Well done, ladies. Thank you so much. And um, yeah, maybe I want to add a little bit to that question. You know, yes, there was more pokes in the babies who developed the late onset sepsis, but this is statistics which also goes beyond my head. It, it, we hired uh, the HMRI people to look at this because you have to look at the amount of days till the first infections. What is your comparison group and how do you adjust for all these differences in timing from pokes to infections? And um, so we, we've hired them and they know it's going to be a difficult task even for them. But um, um, hopefully by, what do you think, Joe and Michelle? End of the year, maybe, maybe, yeah, that we have the actual data. I think so. I hope so. Yeah. Fingers I think you might be being a little bit optimistic because uh, if we have a 24-weeker, they're still going to be in hospital at the end of the year. <laughs> okay. All right, then. A <laughs> little bit optimistic. Right. Any more question questions for Joe or Michelle? I don't see any in the chat and I don't see any hands raised in that note. In that case, we might all have 15 minutes back of our day and you can see the QR code and the link for attendance certificates up there if you want them. Um, well done, everyone, and thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, thank you, Michelle. Thank you all. Great study. Sorry, is it possible to get that QR code back up? I couldn't get it. Yes, it certainly is. Thank you. There you go. So interesting, Jo. Oh, thanks, Karen. It's, it's, it's interesting hearing all these questions. Like, oh, that's a good idea. We should have thought yeah, of that. Yeah. <laughs> So much of what we do is routine. Routine, do this, do this. Oh, totally. Or they do, blood, or they do bloods and then they come and do um, the the Guthrie the Guthrie tests. Yeah, so yeah. Like and it's yeah that that bundling and we yeah. were actually going to tackle it as a um, CPI in um, the unit, but mm. we thought, well, how do you, like really to change this practice? And it's got to be wider than just our unit. We're going to have to forget the evidence. Yeah, and so. it's looking, looking at what we're all doing in different practices. I mean, how often do you measure blood sugars in babies when they've initially had hypoglycemia? Then it's unless somebody actually actively thinks about it, the routine keeps going. Yeah. And, you know, but the, as you know, babies will tell us when they need. They will tell us when they need. We, we don't need to be doing sampling to say, yep, you're good. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Um, do we need to stay on to do anything or not? You have everybody. Sorry about it. the early finish, but we knew it wasn't going to. I'm going. Oh no, you full time. That's okay. I'm sure everybody is very happy to have 15 minutes back of the day and get lunch. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. It was really interesting, and I think it's just such a, an important clinical study. Hope you're going to look at presenting it in Coin next year. Oh. <laughs> oh, Melissa, I'll just get through today. And yes, that's a great idea. But thank you for the, the encouragement, Karen. Yeah, it's very, Den very Coin, appreciated. Coin will be in Denmark next year. In the oh, early May. okay. Now you're talking. Denmark, yeah. early May will be the next Coin Conference. You should come and present. Okay. 
Yeah. I'll send Write it to you. Down. Okay. <laughs> Beautiful. Thanks, Kat. Yeah, Thanks so much. Great. great study. Thank you all. See you Bye. later. Thanks. Bye.